Hello, everybody at Rarefest 20. I'm Lucy Mackay. I'm the CEO and founder of Medics for Rare Diseases. And I'm here to introduce you to the DNA doc, Melita Irving, who's a clinical geneticist, a consultant who specializes in um, disorders of the skeleton. And uh, before we go ahead with the session, I just want to um, give some background. So earlier, this uh, wonderful conference started off with hearing from families through the journey of hope and for the power, learning about the power of a diagnosis for families. But a rare genetic diagnosis can't come without looking at DNA. And that is why we've brought the DNA doc here to show us DNA live. And, uh, and nothing could go wrong with that. So that's really good. So she's going to take you through um, what you're going to need. And I, without any further ado, I will let Melita introduce herself. Thank you, Lucy. Good morning, everybody. I am Melita, um, and this is my uh, semi-willing volunteer, my son, Miles. Um, the, 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 the geneticists amongst you, the, the budding geneticists amongst you might have recognized the genetic similarity uh, before I introduced him, but thank you, Miles, for your help today. Um, yeah, so I am a clinical geneticist. So what's that? Well, um, I'm a doctor. Um, I am a trained paediatrician, I'm a doctor for children, and within that I specialise in genetic conditions. So um, children who have lots of different problems going on and no one can quite fathom uh, why one child can have so many things and be so unlucky, but it's my job to see if there is a, uh, a single explanation, a single reason to explain everything and, and whether that is something about their genetic code, whether there's a change in the genetic code that has, has created that. So yeah, so I, I'm a clinical geneticist, codename DNA doctor. Uh, so yeah, and um, I don't know if anyone earlier caught the um, rare youth revolution quiz, but that's a, that was a great feeder to this session. Um, they asked lots of questions and they kindly based them on this book, the Haynes Human DNA Manual. Um, and uh, that is the book that we're going to be using today for the recipe. And for those of you who have it, page 61, uh, the recipe for extracting DNA from strawberries. Um, so what you need is some strawberries. So I like English strawberries and I'm delighted to find that still in November, we have British strawberries on sale in the shop. So and there's a whole bowl here. I don't need them all, but uh, we'll do. We'll find something to do with those later. Uh, what else do we need? We need Ziploc bags because uh, we're going to be smashing up the strawberries in a Ziploc bag. Um, so there's some Ziploc bags. Uh, glass containers. So we need two. But when Miles and I were practicing, we broke the coffee filter bag and found that we needed three glasses as a backup. So um, hopefully we won't need three, uh, but we've got them just in case. What else do we need? We need washing up liquid and um, I have here washing up liquid from Lidl, my favourite shop. Uh, it's pomegranate flavoured. Uh, there's no particular benefit from using pomegranate uh, washing up liquid <laughs> from Lidl other than when you get your DNA out at the end, it smells of strawberries and pomegranates. So that's why I like to use I that. Combo. <laughs> Other washing up liquid is available. Good old sacks of salt. Good old fashioned sacks of salt. That's going to be handy for the lysis solution. We've got some water here as well for the lysis solution. I'll tell you what lysis means as, as, we, as we go through. You're going to love this. Um, coffee filters. The best. Melita coffee filters. <laughs> no other Melitas are available. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> uh, rubbing alcohol. Uh, so rubbing alcohol. We have some in, we have some in a Pyrex jug here, um, uh, which um, uh, uh, well, as we get there, I'll tell you what rubbing alcohol does and what it's for. And that, that is the magic ingredient. It's easy to get, by the way. Um, it's, uh, I got that from Amazon, so it's, uh, it's easy to get hold of. I'm, I'm told that it's a, a, an old fashioned cleaning um, material. So um, yeah, it, it was really easy to get. And uh, bamboo stick, which uh, it's not summer anymore, so I can't, can't do my barbecue kebabs. So what else am I gonna do with this? I'm gonna use it to extract DNA from strawberries. <laughs> So Lucy, shall we, uh, shall we get on? Shall we uh, start? Yeah, let's get on. You start, so you're gonna start crushing those uh, strawberries, aren't you? We are. <laughs> yeah. Can, do you think you can do more than one thing at once? Can, can I distract you with questions? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> so, it all goes first, 
<laughs> First of all, um, I've got a question, which is, let's just start from the very beginning. What is DNA? Well, DNA is a chemical. We'll save those for later. Yeah. <laughs> DNA is a chemical found in the cells of our bodies that contain the genetic instructions. Um, so it stands for deoxyribonucleic uh, acid. So it's, it's an acid that's found in the body inside the cells that contains the code uh, that makes up the genes that gives the blueprint to make up a person or an animal or a creature or a plant. Um, so, so DNA is, um, is, is that magic ingredient that, that determines everything about us. So I, I have this book that my parents gave me because mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'm a sibling so and it was first published in 1992 and in 1992 they thought DNA looked a bit like this oh yeah do we still think it looks like this we do still think it looks like that yes <laughs> and we've got and we've got a question this is from Elliot who's seven and he submitted this via Instagram hi Elliot um so what he would like to know how does our DNA make us different that's, Elliot, that is a great question. I was so delighted when that came through. Um, so the, the DNA is made up of um, different bases um, and the bases are represented by the letters A, C, T and G. And if you remember back to Lucy's picture, maybe she'll show us again. Yeah. Uh, DNA is made up of a double helix. So it's got one str string going one way and wrapping around it in a double helix, in a helix uh, format, is another string. And so the way it does that, the way it holds itself together in that way, is that the bases link together. So um, C uh, maps with G, they link together, and T maps with A, they link together. And then the whole thing uh, creates this double helix. And um, it's, th it's the, the order of those letters or the genetic code, which makes the proteins that uh, make up our bodies. And our bodies are made up of about 200,000 different proteins. They're proteins in our skin, in our hair, in our heart muscles, in our guts, everywhere. The, everything about us is made up of different proteins. Um, and the, uh, the codes for the really important parts of the body are exactly the same in everybody but there are lots of variations or lots of places in the genetic code where everything is, can be different in one person to the next. So that's what, we, that's what creates genetic variation. So if you compare my genetic code with yours, Lucy, we will find that there's about a million differences. And mm -hmm. anyone looking at the screen can tell that you and I look different. Um, and those differences in the, in the gen genetic code, they're not damaging, but they just have subtle effects upon our proteins. And they can make, for example, our face shape a bit different, the shape of our nose is different, the shape of our chin's different, our hair color different, um, that sort of thing. If you compare my genetic code with Miles's, there's gonna be a lot more similarities because he's half of me. So uh, he's pleased about that. So, you're the best uh, half, Miles. <laughs> Yes. And so we, I heard earlier on that, on the youth of the youth revolution quiz, that we uh, share a lot of DNA with a banana. Those boys are right. We do share about 60% of our DNA with, with bananas. Uh, so, yeah, and in fact, DNA similarities um, in different species are huge. And that might make you surprised. Uh, but actually, if you, so as you said already, Lucy, I'm interested in skeletons in particular. And if you compare the human skeleton with the skeleton of a, a mouse, and even with the skeleton of a bat or a, um, a, 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 a humpback whale, our skeletons are actually very, very similar. That that main kind of template, that main blueprint is exactly the same in, in, in pretty much all of the species. But then there are those subtle differences um, that, that make us different in terms of, well, human beings can walk upright, we don't scurry around on, on all fours, we don't have a tail, we don't have fur, all those things make us um, slightly different. And, and that we think is part of a, an evolutionary process. So changes in the DNA, which allowed us to do different things, which made us survive better in the environment that we were in. And, um, and then and that's how humans evolved and different creatures evolved down their different evolutionary trees. Well, I'm excited to say, Milita, that Elliot is listening. So, and he says hi. So hopefully he feels you answered his question. Now you look like you've got some really nicely smushed 
yes, strawberries yes. there. What's happening next? Miles has beautifully smashed up the strawberries. <laughs> Ordinarily, I'd tell him off for doing things like this, but on this <laughs> occasion, it's, it's, it's called for. Thank you, Miles. <laughs> so are we going to move on now to the next steps? Yeah, let's go. Let's do that. So step three. OK, so now we need to add the... Uh, we need a glass. Which one should we use? Let's use the pub pint glass. <laughs> uh, we need to add the water to it. Thank you, Miles. Um, What's that? 120 bottles of water going right. into the <laughs> Yeah, I mean, let's, let's do it in order. Why not? So we don't miss it. It's a very important thing in science is to do things in order, in the correct order, so you don't miss anything off. Don't go rogue and start adding washing up liquid uh, ahead of the salt or anything like that. So, okay, we've got the uh, measurers here. So, how much? How much washing up liquid we need? Two, two teaspoons of washing up liquid. <laughs> this, is not really this, is, this is like baking, and I'm not that good at baking. <laughs> yeah, word of warning: little washing up liquid comes out really fast. I think they want me to go back and buy more sooner than I might otherwise have planned. <laughs> smells really good. It smells of pomegranate. <laughs> Thank you, Miles. What else do we need? We need half a teaspoon of salt. Bring on the saxa. <laughs> okay, so that is the blue one. That's half a teaspoon. Also comes out very quick. That's why it's called running salt. So this is, um, so all together, the salt and the washing up liquid and the water, they create what you call a lysis solution. What's lysis? So a lysis, lysis solution um, allows the lysis process to uh, to take place. Here goes the water now. So we're going to do that gently, pop the water into the glass. So lyse, when you add a lysis solution to, um, to cells, they explode. So a lysis solution is really an explosion. And the idea is we want the, um, the, the DNA to blast out of, the, out of its cells, out of its, the safety casing that it's got. We want it out and we want it to come into solution. Um, so, okay, so we want, yeah, we want to get it out of those cells, break it, let it break free. Exactly right. Um, okay, so next we're going to add the lysis solution to the strawberries. This is definitely a two-man job. <laughs> oh. Here it goes. Let's see Miles' accuracy. <laughs> Incendiary device going in there to make an explosion. <laughs> Watch out, everybody. Done up nice and tight. Got to get the air out. Oh, we did that in the last step. That's good. Okay, must make sure Ziploc bag is closed. Otherwise, lysis solution and strawberry goo all over my kitchen floor. I can't. Heard it. I can't. Make sure that Ziploc bag is closed. <laughs> well, so do you need to leave it to, to act or anything? Well, we, we can leave it to act while, while Miles fiddles with it and we have a chat. Yeah, <laughs> if we did. Do, we had one important question come in quite early, like a few days ago, in fact, and it was from Olivia. She's seventeen, and she said, "She said I have CKD thirteen related developmental disorder. Where is this gene?" Olivia, it was lovely to receive your question, and thank you very much for putting that through. It was a really important question. Um, so I think I already mentioned that there are 20,000 genes and your gene is one of those 20,000 genes. Now I say your gene, but actually everybody has this gene. Um, yours is slightly different, Olivia, so it's had a different effect upon you. Um, so it's a different kind of variation that we call pathogenic variation. So it's, it's had a much more of a, 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 an effect upon, upon you and who you are. And um, if this, this gene, we have two copies of it, like we do every other gene, because you get one from your mom and one from your dad. And every cell of the body, the, one, the ones that we're just trying to make explode right here, right now, contain the 20,000 genes. And how do you get 20,000 genes into a tiny, tiny cell? And in fact, inside the nucleus of a tiny, tiny cell, well, you have to package it up and, and, um, and make it like really tight and compact. And the way that we do that for 20,000 genes is that we package them up on chromosomes. So Lucy has been getting her daughter's Play-Doh out. I don't think Robin knew that it had been stolen in the, in the depths of the night, but there it is. She's made herself a chromosome seven. And that is where CD, CKD13 lives. In fact, it lives on the short arm of chromosome seven. So Lucy, without destroying your artwork, can you show us the short arm? So, 
Short arm is this yellow part, and the long arm is this orangey part. And good old fashioned chromosome analysis was done by looking down the microscope and chromosomes were uh, treated in a certain way to make them stripy or to give them what we call bands or G-bands because Dr. Giemser uh, was the first one to discover that this stain could make chromosomes, uh, different chromosomes show up uh, different stripes and different bands from other chromosomes. So for example, chromosome seven has the same stripes as every, as every other chromosome seven, but chromosome eight has some things, a different stripe pattern. So that the cytogeneticists, the, uh, the genetic, genetic scientists that used to look down microscopes and look at chromosomes could pick out um, in the melee of chromosomes dumped in, in the cell, which one was chromosome seven, which one was chromosome eight. So there are um, 23 different chromosome types, one to 22 uh, that males and females share the same, or the autosomes. And then there are the sex chromosomes, the um, males having an X and a Y chromosome and females X and X chromosome. So number seven, chromosome number seven, is the seventh longest chromosome. That's why it's called that. And it's divided up into different bands, um, as I explained. And so uh, the, the Olivia's gene, the, the gene that she has the particular change in, change in is, uh, is in the short arm, the yellow, the yellow bit, quite close to the centromere. The centromere is the center of the chromosome where it's kind of transitioning from short arm to long arm and uh, uh, my beautiful assistant is uh, demonstrate that this one not that one is demonstrating the, uh, the, the where the gene is so that's where it is Olivia on the short arm of chromosome seven and so you know this Melita my uh, my lovely uncle is a is a cytogeneticist I sent that I sent it to him a picture and I said which chromosome is this Terry <laughs> and, he, um, and he said he was thinking seven or eight so you know, that's pretty cool so you start off so when I we might think of DNA as like a string you know like when you're thinking about it letters in a row but obviously there must be like strings and strings and strings and strings of uh, DNA <laughs> so this is how it's all wrapped up into into the cells is it yes it is um, and it's it's not just as simple as that because it, it so if you if you if you put some um, earphones in your handbag, Lucy, not the wireless ones, the ones with the wires, and you put them in your handbag, and then five minutes later you take them out, they're all knotted. I mean, it's just yeah, it's just there's just no explanation why uh, these these wires just inexplicably get knotted in your handbag when nothing made that happen. So you don't want that to happen to your DNA. So it is it's coiled around um, these proteins called histones. So it's a very organized structure, it's a beautifully organized structure. And that's no accident. That that in itself is determined or dictated by genetic instructions as well. Um, and then what, what again, one of the things that makes us different. So if we could just go back to Elliot's question, and we talked about my DNA being different to yours and a bit, bit, bit more similar to Miles's, but if you got identical twins their dna is exactly the same yet and they look they look pretty similar but you can always tell there's some yeah. differences between yeah. twins and that's because there's something um, else that goes on in the dna epigenetics so that is chemical markers that get stuck on the dna that change the way the dna works and those chemical markers are pretty random they can be different in one twin to another and that is what determines why twins are slightly different and part of those um, uh, those differences in that in those additional chemical messages or different chemical markers that get stuck on the DNA um, happen around the histones. Um, so so that, that's where you get some variation on top of variation. Yeah, I so I get very excited by epigenetics, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite topics no one normally talks to me about it except for you Melissa <laughs> so um oh, together Lucy don't we <laughs> yeah so master of ceremony ceremonies miles are we ready to move on to the next step do you think yes yeah <laughs> okay what's what is the next step we're getting distracted <laughs> yeah I know we're having too much fun oh I think it's going to be a messy step I think it involves a coffee filter but without you don't get to drink coffee yeah, this is the step where if 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 it's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong here. So maybe I should, everyone. We have some kitchen roll on hand, don't you think? So <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's already thought of that. We've got some behind us. <laughs> so where you need your your pint glass number two. You put in your Melita coffee filter. Beautiful, excellent. And what do we do now? We're going to. Gently pull this into that. Gently being the key. 
<laughs> this is another two man job. So someone to hold the paper in in uh, in position, and then someone to pour in the strawberries. I, I, I'm, yeah, I, my favourite program is Saturday Kitchen, as you know, Lucy. Uh, but I, I clearly haven't picked up all the um, that kind of stage uh stage management stuff because i'm now going to put this in front of my face as i pour it which oh, okay not so, work like Lisa, so you don't forget what she looks like uh, <laughs> here we go anyone else nervous about the strawberries going into the coffee filter <laughs> i have to say now i've got a baby i do realize that strawberries are very difficult to get out although i was always surprised banana is worse anyone else found that <laughs> banana was terrible for cloves well, talking of bananas again, they're sort of the hot fruit of the day. Of the <laughs> um, so you can also do this with bananas and you can do it with kiwis. And the reason why strawberries, kiwis and bananas are good for this is because there it happened. <laughs> Everything just came outside of <laughs> There's a, a hole created in the filter. Miles kept saying to me, stop pouring, stop pouring. I carried on. OK, so that's why we need the spare glass. <laughs> oh, <you. laughs> no. I thought it was over. <laughs> I did. I did say on Twitter, "Don't uh, never work with geneticists and strawberries." <laughs> <laughs> never never work with right. geneticists. Okay, so what's the lesson from this? We don't put in as much like Miles. Miles uh, told me, but it's like it's like again like baking where you're like, oh, I'll just put more and more and more. Yes. Don't change it. Okay. So maybe okay. Miles, just... you be in charge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So strawberries have seeds on the outside and kiwis have seeds on the outside. And although you don't really realize it, well, that's enough, that's enough. The, um, the, uh, the black bits in your banana are also seeds. Yeah. So seeds contain, uh, they're the cell that has the nucleus and what do we know is inside the nucleus? Everybody. Hey. <laughs> So here we go. The instruction is to squeeze slightly. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. I know what happens when uh, you, you challenge a, a, a coffee filter of paper with um, gooey strawberry mess. So well, um, shall I ask you a question from yeah. the audience while we're waiting for the next <laughs> thing? Yeah, we did just, we, ha we have one, uh, but we've had so many lovely um, comments that I'm just going to go back for a bit. Mm, pomegranates and strawberries. What? <laughs> what portion of our genome is functional? Oh, this is a great question. Who asked that? Oh, oh, is it Daphne? That is a very good question. Oh, Daphne here and watching with my two little ones, age nine. Oh no, no, that's that's the person before. It's Pushparaja. Pushparaja, who I think is in South Africa. Oh wow. Well, good morning, Pushparaja. Uh, and hi Daphne and your little ones. <laughs> So uh, that the, what, how much of the genome or the genetic code is functional? So th this is a great question because um, about two to three percent, so not very much, of our whole genetic code contains the genes that, uh, are that, that contain what we call the coding sequences. So the coding sequences are how you can, tr the, 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 the instruction to turn that DNA into proteins, uh, which is what our bodies are made up of. So only a tiny part of the genome is made up of the actual bits that make proteins, which leaves the question, what's the rest of it for? And why do we bother to replicate it? So when you make new cells, you copy the DNA in its entirety, and you move a new set of DNA to the, to, to the daughter cell, the cell that was born from the old cell. And when you make um, um, eggs and sperm to, um, for the next generation, you do the same thing. You, you beautifully replicate the DNA into, into those cells. So why bother to replicate 97, 98% of the genome that doesn't actually do anything? Well, and, it's, and because it, we think it, well, we used to think it doesn't do anything, uh, it was called junk DNA. However, as we get cleverer and cleverer at uh, sequencing DNA, at reading all the letters, all those ACs and Ts and Gs throughout the genetic code, we're finding that in the junk DNA is actually a lot of really important stuff that we're still um, trying to uh, find out about. Um, and so uh, as time goes on, uh, we'll, we'll find out more and more about what lies in that so-called previously known as a junk DNA. <laughs> oh. We think it's things like, Lucy, um, 
uh, things in that junk DNA make, may make genes work harder or less hard. Uh, and that can be different in different people. Would you, would, would people call telomeres junk DNA? So telomeres um, is officially the ends of chromosomes. So it's um, in, in, in genetics, uh, we love, and in medicine in general, we love weird words that have a Latin and or a Greek origin. And this is one of them. So um, the telomere, the telo is Greek for um, far away. So it, it's the end of the chromosomes. Um, and so, yes, that, 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 well, we think that there's not much going on at the end, ends of the chromosomes, um, but uh, two caveats to that. One of our old fashioned chromosome tests, when we um, did a standard carrier type, when we had Uncle Terry look down the microscope and see if we could uh, find any changes in that banding pattern because chunks of chromosome had gone awry, gone missing, or there are extra chunks of chromosome there. One of the, 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 the next um, developments in that chromosome test was to look very specifically at the telomeres, the ends of the chromosomes, because we started to see that ends of chromosomes could go missing in people who had developmental disorders. Um, and so actually, if, if a piece of chromosome goes missing and you get yourself a developmental disorder, then clearly there's something important about that end of the chromosome. So maybe it is important. And then aging, we know that telomeres get shorter as you get older. And when you get older, what happens to you? Oh, well, feeling it every day now, but uh, uh, yeah, you, you start, the aging process occurs and you're not as healthy and fit and as strong as you used to be. Um, and so, um, which is why I'm sitting down, he's standing up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, do you remember, I don't know if I told you this, that once um, telomeres were on the news, the reason I bring up telomeres is because they were in the rare, rare Youth Revolution quiz and I thought, okay. very good question. Yes, but, uh, they did you know, ask that. In the news and my nanny, who's very old herself, rang me up and said, do you think Grandad, who is now 98, has really long telomeres? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Well, Lucy, we had that um, webinar at the Royal Society of Medicine a, 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 about a month ago now, um, and we had uh, some experts from around the world talking about the genetics of longevity. So what, what genes can, um, can make you live longer or make you yeah, live um, healthy aging is what, is what they call it. So, yeah, it's a fascinating field that's just starting to unravel. They, they've been studying the genetic code of um, octogenarians, nonagenarians, and centigenarians, so people who are 80, in their 80s, 90s, and 100s, to find out if there are any clues in their genetic codes which say, why do they live so much longer? They, uh, they need to speak to my granddad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how's your goo going? Well, okay, I, I'm really tempted to squeeze the bag to get the last bits out, but Miles is like at the corner of his mouth saying, don't squeeze it. <laughs> so, so, right, we okay. do have another question if you want to keep going, or do you, or who, are we going to go risky and squeeze? Uh, well, Miles has got a brilliant idea, he's going to squeeze it separately, so, <laughs> so if, it, um, if the bag breaks, no harm done, but if it doesn't, we've got ourselves an extra lot of uh, exploded strawberry goo. He's doing really well. Let's take another question while he does that. <laughs> okay, so we've got a question from this lady who, this is like a family like a journey for me. This is my sister-in-law. She's Sarah, she's 27, and she's a pediatric oncology nurse in Southampton. Morning, and she Sarah. asks, what's the difference between DNA and RNA? Oh, now that is another great question. Thank you, Sarah, for, for putting that out there. Um, so, well, first of all, they've got different names. So DNA um, is deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA is ribonucleic acid. So it hasn't got the deoxy bit at the front. And deoxy means an oxygen molecule has been taken away uh, from the ribose and it's, uh, and it's now deoxyribose. So that's DNA and RNA. Um, so when Watson and Crick discovered that DNA was a double helix back in 1953, and they were very pleased with themselves, they said, yeah, we know now that DNA is a double helix. Uh, and they, they, to do that, they used the picture of um, uh, uh, Rosalind Franklin and um, Morris Wilkins to, to determine that uh, DNA is a double helix. So they're very pleased with themselves. Yeah, we, we know it's a double helix. And everyone said, wow. There's Rosalind, thank you. And that's the picture that they used to work out that DNA was a double helix. It, it's like looking down on top of that, um, that double helix uh, structure. 
Uh, Miles needs a tissue. He's got goo all over his hands. He's shaking all over my legs. Uh, <laughs> the Science Museum in London, or could, but I think this model is actually at the Science Museum in London. Yeah, it might be, but we also, I mean, originally, um, Rosalind Franklin did her work at King's College London, mm -hmm. uh, which is, 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 is my academic uh, university. Uh, and that is, is on display in the medical school. And I was um, invited to the archives uh, last summer, last year in 2019. Um, and I actually saw the original photograph. So it was a very um, yeah, humbling moment because yeah, she took that photograph. Watson and Crick uh, came up with the, 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 the genius realization that DNA is made up of this uh, double helix. And so people said, wow, that's that's so cool. What you've done is really cool. And they said, yeah, we know. And they said, yeah. so, uh, so, so, right, so double helix, how, how, how does it work then? How do you get from this double helix to proteins? And they went, oh, I don't know. Uh, so th there's, there was a missing piece of the puzzle here. So um, the code of life had to, be, had to be worked out. So the code of life is where you read uh, three of your letters, your A, C's, T's and G's, and those three letters correspond to an amino acid. And an amino acid is a tiny little molecule that when you put lots of them together, you get a protein. So, uh, so the way that the genetic code works is that for every three letters in those coding regions, that, 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 those really important bits of the, um, of the, um, of the genetic code, uh, they uh, correspond to different amino acids, and when they, they so when they're read in succession, amino acid gets added to amino acid to amino acid to amino acid, and there we have our uh, full length protein. There's a little bit of pimping that goes along of those proteins as well, but ultimately that that's how they're created. Um, but you don't just go from DNA to protein. Ta-da! There's a middle there's a middleman, and the middleman is RNA. So the code is translated into uh, it's transcribed rather from DNA into RNA, and then it's from the RNA using these little purple blobs in the picture here, Lucy. Uh, the purple blobs are ribosomes, and the ribosomes travel along the RNA, and they say, okay, we've got three. Uh, code the three letters of the, de of the of the genetic code here that corresponds to amino acid called glycine. Let's get a glycine out of the cupboard and stick it here, and then the next it moves along and reads another three and says, "Okay, that's a leucine. Uh, let's take that one." Uh, yeah, that's why I chose it. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> there isn't a melitaine or a malzine, unfortunately, oh. um, but I but I do have filter coffee bags. Um, so <laughs> So, um, so the, yeah, the, uh, the ribosome moves along the RNA, translating it into protein. So that's the, the difference between DNA and RNA and how you get that link to uh, protein. Um, RNA is all the rage at the moment because uh, coronavirus is, uh, the genetic material inside coronavirus is RNA based. It's not DNA based like, like us. Um, there are some um, viruses which are DNA based, but this one isn't one. This is an RNA based virus. And so lots of um, uh, attention has been around the coronavirus vaccines recently because um, the three vaccines that have been developed so far are all based on, um, on, 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 on counteracting the RNA, the spike protein, the, the, the genetic code in the RNA that makes a spike protein that gives it that characteristic um, appearance um, that we see in our papers on, on our social media every day. These little spiky bits are made from the RNA um, clues. Because Corona is, uh, I don't know, Latin, crown? Corona, crown, and those little spikes make it look like it's got a crown, right? That's exactly right. Nice one, Lucy. <laughs> so, Martha Miles, are we ready to finish the experiment and look at some strawberry DNA? This is the, this is like the, 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 the big reveal. <laughs> this is the big reveal. So next thing that we do alcohol. is alcohol. Uh, um, so it has when, been a tough day. It has been a tough day. So when, uh, when Miles and I were practicing this and, and, and working out all the mistakes that had occurred, one of them has already happened, uh, we realized that pouring straight from the bottle into the glass uh, meant that uh, we poured in too much and it went everywhere and, um, and it made a, a terrible mess. I uh, wasn't happy. So we, this time we have decanted some into a Pyrex jug. Genius. 
Um, and it's been sitting here on the side while we've been talking. I've been a bit worried it might be evaporating um, like, like my glass of wine seems to do on a Saturday evening. Uh, but uh, it, it, we've still got some, so that's good. <laughs> so this is really strong alcohol. This is way stronger than that aforementioned glass of, uh, of wine. Um, and, um, and what this does is at the moment we have the, 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 the strawberry goo. Let's show you the strawberry goo in the glass. Uh, and the DNA is in there, it's in solution. Um, so it, you can't see it. It's just it's, like, it's, it's like floating around, floating around, yeah. floating around and we can't see it. Um, so, but when you add the alcohol, it comes out of solution and it should appear before your very eyes. So if we're clever with the camera, Miles, can we put it closer to the camera and pour it in without getting um, well, this, I'm, this this solution on my laptop? <laughs> what possibly go wrong? Okay, so your hand is over. Yeah, is oh, that's, oh, look, he's, have you done this before? To <laughs> okay, here we go. So watch the, watch the, uh, the goo in the glass. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Fingers crossed. Oh, we've got two layers separating. We have two layers separating. The one, one looks really red, Melita, and the other one looks like fuzzy white. That's exactly right. One, the one at the bottom is the remnants of my little washing up liquid uh, and the strawberries. Lift it up again, Molly, and the strawberry. Oh, that's okay. So that's the strawberry is the ready bit. The strawberry at the bottom. And then there's that, that kind of weird gloopy stuff on the top. Let's have, yeah, a, let's have a closer look at that. So here's the, my kebab stick. Oh, at last, the kebab. Kebab and alcohol this morning. That gloop is DNA. Ta -da! <laughs> I can't believe this happened. <laughs> I can. It is a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> that is the strawberry is. DNA. Yes, that's strawberry DNA. Can you read it? Can you look at it? <laughs> oh, there's an A. There's a T. <laughs> it's saying to me, I'm reading it and it's saying, I am nothing like a banana. <laughs> oh, so much more. <laughs> So there we go. That's amazing. That I, want, amazing. I don't know if anyone at home is, has uh, has been doing this as we go along. If they have, I have to say massive applaud to you. Um, <laughs> but you'll have to, if you have, please show us what you've, uh, please put on Twitter or um, other social media what you managed to achieve. Yes, in keeping with my um, Saturday Saturday Kitchen Live uh, scenario, uh, people always send in the pictures of the dishes that they cooked based on the, the chefs that were in the uh, in in the in the guests in the kitchen. So yeah, show us your DNA. <laughs> don't, please don't ingest anything you've made. Please do not eat anything you've made. No, absolutely not. I, I, there's a quite a powerful chemical waft coming from this. So <laughs> got just under eight minutes left, and I'm just feeling this huge sense of relief. I think you probably are too. <laughs> really. You can ask me to do it again at speed. <laughs> So um, we've got some questions in the panel, but so that we can um, make sure that we answer them properly, I think maybe we'll uh, we'll get back to you with all of those questions. They'll be sent to us. You can also see Melita at her DNA doc booth. Um, you might be able to find your question in here and uh, your answer in here, which I think you suspect I suspect you will be able to. Um, someone's asked about this book. I mean, this was given to me because I was having carrier testing at the time, and it was a few years ago now. It's so published in 1992, so it's a beautiful, very beautiful book. But I'm sure we can find some other ones out there if you need one for a child. But my parents snuck it onto my shelf just so that I'd come across it and learn about genetics. And then and it did a good job, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think this, like, I mean, this has been a fun experiment, but as we started with genetics and and um, genetic technology is just, is hugely important. We were talking about uh, diagnosis, but um, there's more, there's more things being done than just uh, taking the DNA from strawberries. So um, Melita, how, does this technology like you know how does it get used how do we make people better because that's what we really want to do make them have a full life yes and, and dna um can be used in every walk of life today um in in so many different ways so from forensics from solving crimes to um 
looking at uh, evolution and mapping the genomes of Neanderthal man to try and understand how we're different to them and what happened in between. Uh, and um, DNA is also very important for, um, for, for healthcare. Um, so there are lots of applications of DNA today that, that allow us to use it um, when it's absolutely fine and that there are no, as I mentioned before, pathogenic variations. But we can also use new technologies now to look very deeply into the DNA and look for variation changes in the genetic code, which can be damaging. Um, and, and that can uh, allow us to make uh, diagnoses in children uh, and people who have multiple problems, developmental disorders, uh, congenital anomalies, um, unusual looking faces and on, their bodies are formed in a, in a different way. Um, we, can, we can use this technology now to, to screen from start to finish the genetic code. Um, and we call that whole genome sequencing. And uh, just uh, this month it has become available on the NHS. Um, so from the 100,000 Genomes uh, Project, uh, we road tested this in 100,000 people, 100,000 genomes. Um, we road tested it and we worked out how it could apply to uh, medicine. And so now um, we are able to do whole genome sequencing in, 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 in people with those complex disorders. And in fact, not just in them, but in their parents as well. So TRIO, whole genome sequencing, and then we can look for changes in the genetic codes of uh, of the child when compared to their parents. So if their parents are absolutely fine, then we can assume as, as one strategy around this that whatever's happened to the child started in them for the first time, it's it completely afresh. So we look for changes in the child's genetic code that the parents do not have. So, and that's, that's one application of DNA today. But for me, that's not the end of the story. Um, I, I know that many, many people have been on a long journey to try and get to the bottom of their rare disease diagnosis in their family member. Um, and, and it brings so many answers when finally you get that answer. Uh, but, but equally, it's, it can be the start of another journey. So what, what does that result tell us about what we can do to help our family member? And um, th this is going to come very slowly, but there are certain genetic conditions that might affect one particular tissue. So, for example, blindness or visual loss caused by a genetic disorder of one of the genes that makes the back of the eye, the retina. You can use genetic technologies now to create gene therapy. So you can use, many people have heard of this gene editing method called CRISPR, and you can take out uh, the faulty part of the gene, you can replace it with the bit that will make it work again, and then you can deliver that new DNA, that working DNA, to the back of the eye, and then it will regenerate the retinal cells, and then it will help you to see again. So um, th that's a very nice and achievable tissue to target. But when you have a genetic condition that affects every cell of the body, it's going to be a lot harder. And that's going to come some way off in the future when we understand more and more um, about DNA and how you can change it. And at the moment, fiddling with DNA in an embryo um, is, is illegal. So um, genetic technologies um, haven't stretched that far. So we're going to so we've got two minutes to sign off. So if you want to know more about gene therapy in this exciting area, then later at uh, two o'clock on track one, you can catch the brilliant Bobby Gaspar um, talking about how something that was like a hope for the future is now becoming the start of something real. And I would also like to say, if anyone would like to know more about Genomics 101, I mean, it's coming to healthcare and we need our medical professionals to be up to speed on it. Then the Royal Society of Medicine, uh, the medical genetics section are holding a three part series on Genomics 101. This it starts next week. So um, you can find it on the Medics for Rare Disease events as that's the quickest way I can think to point you towards it. Um, and I would like to say a huge thank you to Dr. Melita Irving, the DNA doc and our friend, <laughs> master of ceremonies and general genius, Miles. 
Thank you, Miles. <laughs> Good night. Remember, <laughs> remember to check out this book. You can check out Melita's booth and you can check out the Medics for Rare Diseases booth to find out what we're doing in order to make the medical profession ready to be allies for the rare disease community. So thank you everyone for joining us and enjoy the rest of Rare Fest 20. Bye. Bye-bye. I'm going to wave until it goes off, okay? <laughs>